we're going to be talking about a couple of really fun and fresh kind of summery drinks. So I'm excited to have everyone here. I'm Andrea Allen. I'm the co-founder of Onyx Coffee Lab, and I'm the 2020 U.S. Barista Champion and the 2021 second place World Barista Champion. And I'm super excited to be joining you all today. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to Revel and Crate and Barrel for making this series possible. So everything we're exploring throughout this whole series is how to take coffee as an ingredient and make it in like a broader array of beverages. So especially as we're coming into these warmer summer months, it's really super fun to play with some different kinds of ice drinks and just different drinks that you can create with espresso and also with brewed coffee. So we're going to be doing that a little bit today. Um, I love to hear your questions as we go throughout the class. So there's a lot of like little details throughout both of the drinks we're going to be making today. Uh, one's called the Eastern Shaker Auto. The other one is called the Job. So if you have any questions throughout about the drinks or about the coffees or just espresso or anything like that, go ahead and put those into the chat and I'll try to answer them as best as I can. And then as we get towards the end, we'll have a little bit of Q&A time. So, all right, let's get started. So we're gonna start with a drink that's called the Eastern Shakerado. A Shakerado is essentially just kind of a broad name for an espresso that is shaken with all kinds of things and it's typically served iced. So today we're calling it the Eastern Shakerado because I'm using a form of sugar called jaggery, which is uh, more of like a raw sugar from India that has kind of like a hint of like really dense earthy sweetness. Um, and it gives the drink like a really specific kind of um, earthy flavor, which is super cool. So it's basically made with espresso, jaggery, and can sweetened and condensed milk. This is one of the most simple drinks that you can make. Um, and I say simple just meaning that the ingredients are super straightforward. Um, it's just espresso and a couple of other things shaken over ice. But one of the really fun things about this drink is that you can really explore like flavor and the way that flavors work together simply by choosing the specific kind of coffee that you want to use and then also choosing the kind of sweetener and then the kind of sweet and fat that you want to put together to make this drink. So a lot of people I have observed drinking this um, drink with caramel and half and half is a great example. Um, but you can really like play with all different kinds of flavors in this drink. Chocolates, you can do just like regular simple syrups. You can do, um, I'm using sweetened condensed milk because it's really good and it's really fun. Um, but you can use um, alternative plant-based beverages. You can use all kinds of things throughout this drink to just like really create the kinds of flavors that you're looking for that can either just be really great on their own or can complement other kinds of foods that you're eating and things like that. Okay, so let's get started. So because of the simplicity of the ingredients of this drink, we're gonna spend some time talking about espresso. I usually don't spend a ton of time talking about espresso in this series, just because we usually are using espresso as like a starting block, as like a core ingredient to our drinks. And the exact same thing is true for this particular drink. But because it's going to really feature the espresso's flavors, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. So the coffee I'm using today is Tropical Weather, which is one of our um, evergreen blends at Onyx. This coffee is really good. I like to call it sunshine in a cup. It's basically a blend of washed and natural processed coffees from Ethiopia. And the goal is to give it a lot of really great fruit flavors, a little bit of chocolateiness, and a little bit of flavor of nuts as you go throughout the experience of drinking this coffee. So I put it into my Breville Barista Pro and I'm just going to pull a couple of shots with it. And I just wanna talk you through what that looks like. So anytime you're making espresso, the thought process is that you want to end up with an, an espresso that is balanced and properly extracted. So when I think about balance, I like to think about sour, sweet, and bitter, all becoming a harmonious like um, balance that makes the drink taste really great. So you don't want any one of those flavor components to be more pronounced than the other. And the way you achieve this kind of balance is by making sure that your extraction in your coffee is in a proper range. 
Extraction is basically just a super fancy word for brew. So the way I usually approach that is I like to think about some really core recipes that I use when I'm making espresso, and I start all of my coffees off that way. So for this particular espresso machine, I have a 54 millimeter portafilter basket. Portafilter basket is just this little metal filter that goes inside of this piece of equipment. And basically what that's gonna tell me is how much coffee should I put in? And the, the way it does that is just simply by its size. Now you can like put slightly different amounts of coffee in this, but for the most part, it's gonna be, there's like a top end range that you can go to. Most commercial espresso machines have 58 millimeter baskets. This is a little bit smaller of a unit and a lot of the Breville lineup has a 54 millimeter basket, which works really great as well. So basically I'm gonna start with 15 grams of coffee into my portafilter. I'm gonna pull out around three quarters of an ounce on each side of my portafilter to make two total shots. And I want that to happen in around 26 seconds. So for this particular coffee, that's a really great place to achieve balance. So it really will showcase the fruitiness of the coffee, but won't have it be overpowering. It'll have that really nice mid-level of sweetness of the chocolate. And then it'll round itself out with a little bitty, tiny bitterness of nuts. Okay, so that's my recipe and I've already dialed this machine in before we started. So I'm gonna go ahead and just walk you through my procedure for making espresso. So I'm gonna start with a clean, dry portafilter. What this will do is encourage the water to just only interact with the ground coffee when it starts going through the bed of coffee itself. So basically the way the coffee is ground, whether it's finer or coarser, and then the way that I prepare it in the portafilter will determine the time in which it takes for the coffee to extract. There's a really kind of simple analogy to explain the connection between brine size and time of extraction. So the finer the coffee is ground, the harder the water has to work to come out, the longer it takes. The coarser the coffee is ground, the easier the water has different ways to filter through and come out, the quicker it happens. So when you're just looking at your espresso machine at home and you're just preparing espresso, if your espresso is like taking a long time to come out, it's just dripping, you know, takes like 40 seconds to come out, super long, that means your grind is too fine and you need to make it more coarse. On the other hand, if you turn it on, your espresso machine on and all of the water comes out and it stops within like 12 seconds, it means your coffee is most likely too coarse and you need to turn it finer. Okay, so for the procedure for making coffee, we've got our clean and dry portafilter, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and let the machine grind into the portafilter. Okay, so we'll just take a quick grind break. And I think I saw a question come through, but I didn't see what it was, but I'd totally love to answer it. Okay. So you can see how full it is. It's coming out just a little bit. Okay, here's the question. So for the 26 seconds, do you start the timer at the sound of the pump or the first drop? I love this question. I talk about this all the time. So basically what, what the question is here is like, is the time from when the espresso starts coming out or from when you hit the button. And so when, I time, when I'm timing this, I'm timing it from the time that I hit the button. Because as soon as you insert the portafilter into the espresso machine, and it even before you hit start and it is like up against the heat of your group head, it's going to start extracting. So that heat and that little bit of moisture that starts happening is going to, or could like affect the flavor of your shot. So really, as soon as you turn it on, that water is going to at least start coming out, maybe a little bit slowly at first, but then it'll really go up all the way up to nine bars and start coming through. So that time, as it's filtering down through the coffee, is like just as important as the time it takes from when it starts coming out to when it is um, finished, or to when the water starts interacting. Great question. I think that's like a question I get asked all the time. Really like it. Okay, so let's return to this little situation here. So you can see we've got a little bit of this coffee on the top and this is around probably 15 and a half grams is what I've got here. And so you can see, you might feel like that if you do this at home, like you might think like, oh, I need to like 
brush that off so I can get it all in there. And for me, like this is part of my um, recipe, so I don't want to get rid of it. What I want to do is kind of settle it down in here. So kind of what I'm doing is just giving a little bit of a tap, and I'm kind of just trying to get it to like come down into the portafilter so I can evenly distribute it, but without like making a big mess and losing much more of the coffee than I already did. Because I really like came across here with some real energy here a second ago. So, okay, now I've got it um, settled down a little bit in here. And now what I'm going to do is just what's called distributing. So I'm just going to like kind of go back and forth in kind of a circular motion, just scraping across the top. And every time I do this, it just like evens itself out a little bit. So my goal really is to like get all of the coffee evenly distributed across the portafilter because the other thing that is so tricky about espresso extraction is that water is lazy and it'll find the easiest way out. So for example, if I have most of my coffee on one side or the other, or if I don't like get it properly distributed and tamped, sometimes the water will like find this little like way to come out and it'll like only extract just a little part of the coffee in here. Now, if you're like making espresso at home and you're like, I have no idea whether to know whether that's happening or not, I wouldn't worry about it. And the main thing to, to focus on is just getting your coffee evenly distributed into your portafilter and then tamped properly. So the tamp is also something I get asked lots of questions about. And so basically you just want to hold this um, tamper like it's a flashlight and then I'm going to actually pull this over across here so you can see a little bit better here in the middle. I'm just going to put it evenly on and before I tamp down I'm just going to make sure it's like even all the way around. So I want to like give as, as like a comprehensive distribution of that pressure as I can. So I'm just going to press straight down. Now you notice I like didn't do anything like super crazy, like try to like really crush it in there. And that's because all you really need is about 40 pounds of pressure. And that essentially equates to just like almost just the weight of your body, just like this. Once you go over 40 pounds of pressure, you can't really compress anymore. So you could do it like as hard as you possibly could, but it's going to be very similar to just that 40 pounds of pressure. Okay, so there's a question about the grind size and the amount of coffee that I'm using today. So on this particular Breville Barista Pro machine, I have it on grind size setting 12, and then the grind time is 11 and a half seconds. Now, I don't typically give that as like, that as like, oh, this is the recommended setting that you should brew your espresso with. Why? Because if you're using a different coffee than I am, you are gonna have a different setting than I do. Because all coffees are different. Even if you have the same coffee from Onyx that I do, um, it could be a different roast date. It could be like a different age. It could have been like stored in a different environment. So I'm using that as like a, there's no right answer for making espresso. It's more just that you want to have like just a starting point for your espresso. And then the really the only way to know at home what kind of like extraction you have or whether you have proper balance or whether you have the right recipe is simply to just brew the coffee and taste it. So for the most part, if you have in this, um, in this setting with 54 millimeter basket and you've got like your coffee, you know, you have enough coffee in, so around, you have around 15 grams and you could do 14, you could do 16. If you don't have a gram scale and you're like, how do I know? Don't worry about it. Just fill up the portafilter and tamp it in there pull your shot. You want to shoot for between 20 and 30 seconds, just like as a starting range, and then just taste it. If it tastes great and you're like, I don't know if I did it right, you did it right. So if it tastes good to you, it's good. Um, if you do it and you taste it and you're like, I don't think it tastes good, then like adjust your grind size and kind of go from there. So I think like, you know, it can feel, there are like lots of really complicated approaches to espresso, but for the most part, like using this kind of guideline of 15 grams in for this 54 millimeter, around three quarters of an ounce out on each side, 
between 20 and 30 seconds is the, is a really great starting range to then get it into that um, in into that like broader recipe and then start tasting. And then you can do things like I've done where I've like suggested you pull this espresso in 27 seconds because I just did it and it tasted great. So I'm like, cool, that's my recipe. Um, awesome. Okay, so we're do we're ground, we're dosed, we're tamped, and now we're ready to pull. So I'm just gonna put it in. As soon as I put it in, I'm gonna turn it on. Get the cups in here. So it's gonna take a minute for it to come out. And this is kind of like a moment where sometimes people will start feeling stressed. They're like, wow, it's been six, seven seconds, nothing's happening. And I always just say like, just hang out and be patient. Here it comes. So you can kind of, you can see it a little bit there and you can see that it's coming out at a decent rate. It looks like a strand of wet spaghetti. It started off darker, now it's getting lighter. And that is the, exactly how a normal espresso extraction happens. So that first part of the extraction is all most of the soluble sweetnesses and sour parts of the coffee that are, that are like coming out first. So it's always like darker, it's more concentrated. And then as it moves through that extraction, you're gonna get a little more of the sweetness, more, and then toward, as you get towards the end, you get more bitterness. So it's sour, sweet, bitter. And you can kind of use the one, two, three phases of extraction to guide what you're tasting to adjust your grind size. So saying all that to say, dark into light in the extraction makes total sense. All right, cool. So I've got my shots. And for this recipe today, I'm actually going to pull another set of shots. So I really just like want for this drink to be super balanced in itself, but I also want for my cup to be full. <laughs> and that sounds kind of silly, but for me, drinks are about two things. They're about your, the flavor experience that you or your guests have with a drink but it's also about the appearance and the eye appeal of the drink itself. So I would be hard pressed to believe that you could see something super beautiful and taste it and like not have like a pretty good experience of it. Every single thing that you see and encounter before you have like a food or beverage experience completely informs what you believe your experience is going to be like. It co totally creates your expectations. So if you're served a drink that looks really great, I mean, it, maybe it's the greatest drink in the world. Maybe it's like an okay drink, but you're probably still going to enjoy it. So for me and this particular cup that I wanted to use today, I want to just get a little bit more liquid in. So I'm going to go ahead and bump up the amount of espresso that I have in this particular cup in order to achieve that. So I'll go ahead and pull another shot. You saw I cleaned and dried my portafilter. Now I'm going to grind again. Grind break. All right, I'm going to try not have so much energy this time so I don't knock all my coffee out. Okay, there we go. All right. So you can see same things happen this time, which is just that, like, I've got an overfull portafilter, which is totally normal. Just going to go ahead and kind of settle it in. I'm not doing anything super aggressive right here. I'm just giving it some, like, taps to help it settle. And then I'm going to just distribute across the top. The goal is, again, to get completely even portafilter bed. Gonna tamp. All right. I'm also going to go ahead and pour these shots into my shaker glass so I can use these cups again. Okay. Here we go. All right. Insert. I'm going to brew. Okay. So let's watch the color of this extraction a little bit this time. And again, I've already turned it on. I'm at five seconds, six seconds. Nothing's happening yet in terms of the coffee coming out. Okay, now here it comes. So you can see how it's kind of dark. Move my hand a little bit. And you can see it's getting a little bit lighter here as it goes along. And again, that's just because all of that like sour kind of fruity 
sweetness is coming out, those solubilities right in the beginning. And then it goes into the sweetness and then into the bitter parts of the coffee. Okay, perfect. So now I've got my espresso. Okay, so now that we've talked a lot, let's go ahead and build this drink. So I've got my espresso. I'm gonna go ahead and pour it in here. Dope, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and put my sugar in here. And this is two tablespoons of jaggery. So you could hear that and think like, that's a lot of sugar, and it is. So I felt like this was a pretty good balance for having these extra kind of shots of espresso in here. Um, but again, this is something you could choose to sweeten, you know, to like keep it at this level of sweetness or to bump it down a little bit too, just whatever you desire. Um, I also have sweetened and condensed um, milk in this drink as well. And so that is also has like a pretty high level of sweetness in it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pour this in. When I say pour, I mean, I'm gonna let's get it to come out there. Okay, perfect. So my coffee is hot. And because this drink is gonna be, end up being iced, I wanna go ahead and just kind of like stir this in because I want that sugar to really dissolve so that it doesn't like leave a grainy texture in the drink itself. And especially too, because the sweetened condensed milk is really like heavy and dense and the viscosity is like kind of bumping on it. Like I wanna make sure that like I have everything dissolved before I get that in there. All right, so now I'm gonna pour in, I went ahead and did two ounces in this one because I have that extra espresso. All right, so I'm gonna pour that in. When I was dosing this out earlier, I was like kind of cracking up and how long it was taking me to dose it because it's so thick. It just is like kind of a real slow roll going on. So you can see I'm still just kind of trying to engage in this like homogenization, which is just like, I'm just stirring it up because I wanna make sure that everything is like really great and mix together before I put the ice in. Because once I put the ice in, I just don't wanna change any of the textures or anything like that until um, before everything is mixed up. Okay? All right, so now I've got it all shaken up, or stirred up, rather. So the last thing to do is just shake it up. And you're gonna shake it with ice to just basically chill it. There's kind of this thought too about like taking espresso and putting it straight over ice that there's this kind of feeling that you want to cool it down a little bit first. Um, and I would kind of agree with that. I'm not a huge fan of just like espresso poured over ice. But in this scenario, I did have a little bit of time for it to cool, but I also added it with some other things. So um, as soon as I added it to that sugar, like the actual flavor and kind of Kind of like integrity of the espresso is not going to change that much after that. All right, so I'm putting some ice in here, and like honestly, I'm a little bit of ice melt in this, which I don't think is a bad. This drink is like, sorry, I'm looking for the exact right piece of ice all the way over here in my bucket. <laughs> um, having a little bit of ice melt in this drink, I think, is actually preferable. So sometimes when I'm making drinks, when we're doing this together, I use something like a shaker bowl because I like don't want to get ice melt because the drink that I'm making is like exactly right with those exact ingredients. For this particular drink, this drink is like really super concentrated. It's got a lot going on in it. And so I think having a little bit of ice melt makes sense. Okay. <gasps> Those of you that have seen this before and know me know that I'm like the world's most tentative shaker. It's mainly because I'm like relatively high energy in my life and I'm afraid that I'm going to like put that energy really hard into shaking and it's going to result in a disaster. <laughs> okay. So I've shaken it up. I've gotten the full flavor of it being a shakerado. Super excited about that. Okay. So now, really the only thing left to do
is pour it in. And I'm not going to fill it all the way up just because like this drink, although this drink is going to be pretty heavy and have like a pretty good body going on in it, it is like kind of, there's nothing buffering it in there. So I just don't want for when I carry it around for it to get wild. So I have a little bit left. I see a question too about subbing out for jaggery sugar. And I would just say, if you want to sub it out, you should use, I'll just give a couple of examples. So something straightforward, like just brown sugar would probably be awesome. Um, honey would be great. Also just like a raw sugar could be cool too. Um, you could even use something like stevia if you don't want to like add those caloric um, input from sugar. Um, and I totally know sometimes when you're making, um, when you're making drinks or following like recipes that calls for things that are like, you're like, I don't know what this is. I don't know where to get it. And even if I did, like, it's kind of expensive. So do I need to buy this? And the answer is no. I put this together because I think it tastes really great. And um, because I think it's super interesting. But you can use any kind of sweetener that you want. Whatever you have in your pantry will work well. Just think about what the base level of sweetness will add to it. So something like brown sugar is going to be heavy, rich, dense sweetness. Something like honey will probably like be a higher level of perception of sweetness, but also have florality in it. I personally love honey. My husband, John, thinks it's like too floral sometimes. So anytime I use honey, he's like, oh my gosh, how much honey did you put in whatever it is? And I'm like, no, it's like just a little bit, but he's really sensitive to that floral kind of nature that goes on in it. So it kind of just depends on like what you have and what you like. You could also just use like standard cane sugar as well. And that would just add like that kind of like um, straightforward sweetness that doesn't have a lot of like dynamic um, flavor or extra added character to it, but will give you that base level of sweetness that you need. Great question. Okay. So for this drink, my last move is I'm just going to like float a little flour on top. So this is like a really fun way to take a brown drink and make it a little less brown. So some of you have heard me say before, one of the really funny things about coffee is that when you start making drinks with coffee, you're very likely to end up with a brown drink. And so I think that that is the nature of coffee. It's super fun when you can end up with a drink that's not brown, but sometimes you just do. And you know what? Like it totally is going to taste great. So I'm not worried about its color, partially because this drink has a couple of really fun things going on in it. And here's what it is. So the first thing is this glass. This glass is beautiful. It is elegant. It looks really great with this drink on it, um, in it. I love the way the light is kind of reflecting off of it in this uh, little market setup that I'm in. Um, and it looks really awesome. And then I just put a little flower on top because I think it adds a really nice pop of color. It looks great when I look at it and it's fun. So you can find edible flowers at grocery stores. You can also do something like herbs. You could also do like, you know, a flower that's not like necessarily ultra edible as long as you don't eat it. Um, but really you can like do all kinds of things to like make the top of this drink look really nice. I am also a kind of big fan of putting coffee drinks in cocktail glasses. So I know a lot of people that have like some really great cocktail glasses and it's hard to incorporate them into very many beverage services that you might do at your house without um, utilizing them for the drink that they're intended for. So a great example is a martini glass. Like it's made for a martini. It's got that very classic kind of like bead round shape to it. Um, so taking those things taking those drinks or no, their glassware and just putting other drinks in them, it kind of can sometimes like elevate the coffee drink itself. And it can also help you have an opportunity to use your great uh, stemware and glasses that you have. All right. I'm going to take a drink. I hope some of y'all are making this at home because this is a pretty great drink. Dang. That is so good. Wow. So 
this is just like a super good example of ingredients coming together to create something greater than its parts. Um, so just on its own, the like, especially like the sugar and the condensed milk. I mean, they're just like a lot going on. But combined with the coffee, this drink is like really sweet. It has like a really great dynamic in terms of like the sweetness that it starts in. And then it kind of like goes down a little bit on my palate to that earthiness and then comes back up with that like really nice um, sweetness from the fat carrier, which is the... Um, sweet and condensed milk. It's like super good. And yum. Okay. Really fun. This is a really fun like recipe that is like a framework for you to take espresso and create all kinds of really fun things with it. So again, you can put any kind of sweetness in it. You can put any kind of like, um, fat product in it. So you could, you could even do it with like a yogurt would be really great. Um, with a plant base like oat or almond. Um, yeah, really great. Cool. Okay, so let's switch gears and let's move over to this drink that we call the Job. So this drink is really fun and we call it the Job because it has banana milk in it and we're all big fans of Arrested Development. Um, so if you have seen this show or you know, interested in it all, the kind of the, su the sub, you know, plot is that there's always money in the banana stand. So this particular drink is going to end up being like a really nice, uh, slightly sweet, like dynamically flavored drink that has maple syrup in it. It has cinnamon in it. It has like kind of this really great banana um, texture. <laughs> not banana texture, but the banana milk is going to have like a really great, like thick, heavy, slick coating texture to it. So let's talk some about the banana milk, which is what I'm making right now. And I, I had this like internal dialogue with myself about whether I wanted to peel four bananas live on this thing today. And you know what? I decided that I was going to. So I hope that everyone's also peeling bananas along with me. <laughs> All right. So again, this is kind of a base recipe for, uh, for this product. And so kind of what I want to do is like the bananas make a really great um, thickening agent and kind of like serve as a fat agent as well without dairy. So I'm a big fan of creating beverages that are really, really great that don't have dairy in them just from the get-go. So I think like in the past that in beverage service, there was kind of this thought process of like, oh, well, every drink comes with dairy, but like if you need a substitute, we have almond milk or we have oat or we have soy or we have like you can make it non-dairy like if you ask. And I think that that is kind of something that is starting to fade away as we like are exposed and introduced to so many really great plant-based alternatives to, to dairy. So there's just like regular occasions where I prefer a plant-based over a dairy in a beverage. And so this is a really good example of that thought process kind of like being played out because this drink is like really, really, and it is not a thought process of like, Oh, but also you can make it dairy free. It just comes that way already. Okay. So let's make the banana milk. So you're going to start off with four bananas. I'm going to put in three tablespoons of cinnamon, which is a lot. Dump that in there. Let's see. It's four ounces. And I'm using oat. I really like the way that oat carries itself in this drink, but you can use almond, you could use whatever you want. And then I'm gonna put in five ounces of maple syrup. So this is designed to be like nice and sweet and have lots of character going on in it. Um, and it's gonna end up being like a super thick texture. So this drink is really designed to be cut with like half banana milk, half coffee. 
And it's going to end up being nice and heavy, but the banana milk itself is like going to be ultra thick. So we'll go ahead and blend this up. All right. <laughs> I'm just like excited that we had like both a grind break and a blend break in the same uh, class today. All right. Also, like this is something I probably would never have done like live uh, not too long ago, but I've been having this thought of like, hey, let's do everything you do on the screen just so everyone can see it. And like if something goes wrong, that's fine. So I feel really great that that went good. Okay, so there's a question about the ripeness of my bananas. And you're right, they're like pretty green. Um, and so I actually would have preferred that those bananas be a little more ripe. This is actually one of those really great, um, this is one of these really great products that I think works totally fine with just like bananas. So like you got regular bananas, you got ultra ripe bananas. Like I think whatever kind of banana that you have is totally fine. I can like smell a little bit of this like, um, greenness to this banana. I'm giving myself a lot of like incredible sensory like uh, credit right now because like I, I don't know if you like had me smell this and were like what do you think about this that I would say green banana because uh, it's got like so much cinnamon in it. Like it honestly it smells like incredible. It actually is really it like really re super reminds me of um banana bread. Yum. All right. So we're getting really close to just making this drink here. So let's take a little like side note and talk about what I'm going to cut the banana milk with. So um, if you're making this at home or if you've made this with me already, you might be looking at what I made and you're like, that is so thick. Like that is not what you would call milk. So if you like have something and you're like thinking about it wanting, you want it to be like a slightly less heavy texture, I would just say like put a little more of your oat milk in there and blend it again. Um, so it's just kind of up to what you're interested in. For us, for me, I want it to be thick because I'm going to put coffee in it, which is like, you know, doesn't have very much viscosity at all. And it's going to end up yielding this really great, um, not quite like smooth, not quite milkshake heaviness, but more like a smoothie. So it's going to end up having like lots of that really like nice, um, like I said, coating oil, um, like great fat content, lots of flavor, all kinds of stuff going on. And so for me, I want it to be heavy, rich and concentrated because I'm about to put it with like 50% of the banana milk, 50% coffee. So let's talk about the coffee component of this. So I think that this drink is really great with a bunch of different things. So I'll just give you a few examples and you can like kind of like input whatever you have. So we're doing it today with just brewed coffee because I felt like that was kind of like the most accessible thing that you could do at home. Um, it is also really great with nitro coffee. So nitrogenated coffee is basically just like a um, a cold brew coffee that has been charged with nitrogen, nitrogen gas to create like that really uh, tight bubble of fizz going on in it. It's like a super popular drink. And, but I think it's something that's pretty challenging to do at home. Um, I do know that there's like little nitrogen home units, but really it's like, that's kind of something that's hard to just execute in your kitchen. So my suggestion for that, if you want to try it, is to grab like a can of nitro coffee at a grocery store. But again, that becomes something that's like you got to have it in your, in your pantry or you got to go out and buy it or whatever. So you can also do it with just regular old brewed coffee. Additionally, if you are like just an espresso drinker at home or you're like, well, I've got this really great Breville espresso machine. So like I don't want to do brewed coffee. You could also do it 
Americano style, just meaning that you would take like two shots of espresso and dilute it with some water. Um, and I would chill it before you add it into the banana milk, but you could do that too. So really the thought process is like, you just want to have this like great flavor of coffee, um, but also a, um, you, we have, like, we kind of just have to dilute it. If that makes sense. Okay, enough talking. Let's make it. So this recipe, super easy, five ounces of banana milk. You can see it's like ultra thick. I'm gonna put a little extra in just for good measure. I have to read this question out loud because I think it's fantastic. Could I comment on possibly adding alcohol in either drink? And it says, I am a bad, bad person. First of all, I love you and you're not a bad person. Um, and I actually was thinking about this before this class because both of these drinks are kind of like shouting booze at me. And so, I mean, I think you actually could put a spirit in either one of these. Um, I personally kind of feel like that brown uh, spirits or liquors go better with coffee. So um, like a brown rum or a whiskey could be really great in one of these. Um, but yeah, I would just say like think about the flavor profile of these drinks and then like what would your spirit add to it and just throw it in there. It could be really great. Um, and I have to say I have many thoughts on the espresso martini and I can't believe I'm um, – bringing this up right now because I'm always cracking up because that is like the go-to drink for, uh, for spirits and coffee together. And my recommendation for anyone interested in coffee and spirits is to break out of the espresso martini thought process and do one of like any of the drinks that I make throughout this entire series could totally go with the spirit and would be super fun, would be very different and would like really showcase coffee as an ingredient in a way that I think is unexpected, enjoyable, and really fun. Okay, thanks for asking. You're not a bad person. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just pour this in here. I'm kind of also just using this as a measuring, as a measuring cup. You can see this is like super thick. I'm actually a little worried that it's too thick. But this is why we do these things together because um, I'm not going to lie, I would love for me to be completely flawless on these things, but we'll see what happens in a minute. But sometimes you just like need to be shown like, hey, it's okay for it to not be go exactly like you want it to. Um, and it'll still work out fine. And also I think it's going to go like I want it to. So we'll find out in a second. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do, I'm, again, I'm going to shake this one with ice. So you all see me shake again with the, like, uh, shaker ball for the dry shake. And, um, again, I think particularly that this drink needs to be cold. Um, so when I'm just, like, touching it right now, it's, like, it's, like, a little cold. I think, like, some of my ingredients I put in were cold. Um, and the coffee that I'm using is was not hot out of this decanter um because i want it to be cold because i don't want the heat to like create any kind of like reaction going on in those bananas i just want it to be uh to be a cold drink but i'm also going to shake it with ice just to like continue to encourage it to be chilled oh yeah <laughs> i really set myself up to shake both of these drinks but it's like it's summer so you got to do it. You got to do what you got to do. All right. I'm just going to give it a good shake. Dope. Golly, this thing smells so good. I hope that y'all have either made it at home or are going to make it at home. Okay. So then I'm going to take my strainer and I am going to strain this one because I want to strain the ice out. But two, I just want to make sure that if there's any like banana chunks that they don't come out. all the way up and you can kind of see the viscosity I thought it was going to be too thick but it's totally perfect I shouldn't have even said anything about it awesome cool 
Okay. So one of the things about this drink that is like borderline unavoidable is that it is like a straight on brown like drink. It just always is. So I picked this really great cup that has some awesome textures on the side and just like has, it's like a purple cup. And so I felt like that this cup was, first of all, I love the shape. Um, I love this kind of like, um, just like it's a straight cup, like just meaning that it goes all the way up. It's just one size the whole way, but that's just like some really great texture to it and some really great color, which I think might be kind of hard to see. But then I'm going to go ahead and like put a little uh, straw in it. Just a tiny little straw. Because I think that this is a this is a drink that's kind of like when it is like a shake in that when you're kind of like drinking, it's kind of got a lot going on. So I think drinking from a straw is a uh, is a good plan for this particular drink. OK, I got a question here. Steam. OK, so the question is about seeing people steam foaming cold espresso using a pitcher and a wand to approximate nitro cold brew. Hmm. So I've actually never seen that done. So basically what this what this uh, person is, is talking about is like taking espresso and I guess water and putting it in the steam pitcher and kind of like steaming it to inject air, which like kind of create some fizzy steam foaming cold espresso using the pitcher and the wand. Yeah. So basically what they're doing is taking the steam wand and they're steaming espresso and water, basically. And what this is happening is the steam wand is injecting air bubbles into the coffee itself, which is probably making it have like a little bit of the fizz and a little bit of a pop to it. So, I mean, just upon like approaching this, I've never even like heard of this or thought of this. So my thought is like, yeah, that totally would work to add a little bit of fizz to it. I think the thing that you're going to want to consider there is like what sort of heat elements are you going to want to add to your coffee? And when I'm saying heat, I mean, obviously you need heat to extract and brew coffee or you need time. So those are the two things that create, create extraction, heat and time. Playing with those two elements is going to change, completely change the dynamics of the extraction and the dynamics of what the coffee are going to taste like. So as an example, like, espresso is like hot water, short time, lots of pressure, and that's what creates the extraction. Brewed coffee is more a longer time, still traditionally the same uh, temperature water, but no pressure, and that creates the extraction. Uh, a cold brew is like no heat, but way more time to create that extraction. And the, all, all three of those methods are going to create different flavors, different body, um, like different levels of like acidity, different levels of clarity. I mean, this is, that's actually one of the like things I love so much about coffee is that there's so many ways to brew it, to drink it, to approach it, to eat it. I mean, it's just like kind of the most incredible like product in the world, but it's also the greatest industry in the world. Um, great community. I just love coffee so much. So my inclination would be that I think that injecting heat into espresso, like after it's already brewed, would probably change the way it tastes. So I don't know. I think if you're interested in it, go for it. I mean, again, I don't want to be the non-expert expert, I guess, here. But I would just say if you do some, if you try something out and you think it's great, go for it. Like whatever, however coffee tastes great to you um, is how you like it. I'm realizing that I didn't taste this drink, and this is like one of my favorite drinks. So good. It's so good. That cinnamon is so great. I just love cinnamon. Awesome. Okay. So these are the two drinks for today. Such a fun pairing. Um, really great introduction to summer. Um, the next summer series that we're going to do is going to feature like some slightly lighter drinks. I would say both of these drinks are like pretty concentrated, pretty heavy, but they're really cold and nice. So I think like we're right at the beginning of the summer. It's not super hot yet. So I think these two drinks like go really well um, in the evening, regardless of the fact that they're like both like 
ridiculously caffeinated. Um, but I think these are really good evening, kind of like outdoor patio drinks or accompaniments to dinner that you might be serving uh, for friends. So these drinks are awesome. Um, I would love to hear if there's like any more questions anybody has about these particular drinks or about espresso in general or coffee or anything like that. Go ahead and put them in there. Um, I also just like want to give another quick shout out to Breville and Crate and Barrel. So they came together to like um, make this whole series happen. We've been doing it for like almost a year now and it's super fun. So basically every month, like I just come on and make a couple of drinks with these great uh, tools that I have here. And they like have created the series so that we can explore coffee as an ingredient together. Um, so I really appreciate them. I also uh, have to give a quick shout out to Onyx Coffee Lab for also making this <laughs> series possible. Um, and if you are watching this live, I um, we have like a code for, for coffee this time. So it's just the code Breville20. So you can get 20% off of something from Onyx just for like the next couple of days through Sunday. So if you want to use that, like go for it. Enjoy grabbing some coffee. And then uh, all of these things are available um, most of these things, some of these things are my tools, but um, uh, on Crate and Barrel's website and on Breville's website as well. So awesome. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoy making these drinks. And if you make these drinks at home and you want to share them with me, just tag uh, Onyx Coffee Lab on Instagram. I'd love to see what you're making and uh, interact with you that way. So thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>